Welcome back, everybody, to Sustainability in the Sea, a podcast for ocean people by ocean people. Today, we have something special for you and a little bit different. So as you probably remember, Carissa went on a National Geographic and Ocean Exploration Trust expedition to study marine mammal behaviors off the island of Maui and Hawaii. While she was doing this, she actually got to interview Dr. Adam Pack, a marine mammal biologist who studies the behaviors of whale and dolphin. And while this episode is a little bit different from our traditional interviews or our talk story sessions, just Carissa and I, we think there's some really valuable lessons to be learned. So in this episode, Carissa sits down with Dr. Pack on the expedition. And mind you, they are in a laboratory on a boat. So it's a little bit loud. Um, it's a little bit rocky. So just bear with them on that. They talk about the power of observation, how we got into marine science, and what we can learn from marine mammals. And I think the best part of the entire interview is a little bit near the end, but it's one piece of advice that he gives aspiring marine biologists. And so with that said, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Pack. I am a marine mammal scientist. I am a professor in the departments of biology and psychology at University of Hawaii at Hilo. I also started a nonprofit here in 1993 in Hawaii called the Dolphin Institute. I've been living and working in Hawaii since I was 20 years old. I'm originally from New York, and I currently live on Hawaii Island, the big island. I've heard why you be called a living laboratory when it comes to scientists coming here and so much left to uncover. Do you think that Hawaii is a living laboratory when it comes to the subjects that you study? I think Hawaii is a living laboratory in the best sense of the word. These are isolated islands uh, in the middle of the Pacific. The species here, many of them are indigenous, were only found in uh, these islands. And the islands uh, culturally include the land as well as the water. There's a, a, a synergistic relationship between the two. You cannot study one without thinking about at least the other. And so my focuses are studying dolphins and whales in these waters. Uh, I've been doing that for over 25 years now with a focus on uh, North Pacific humpback whales on their breeding grounds here in the Hawaiian Islands and where most of them migrate to 3,000 miles north to their feeding grounds in Southeast Alaska. The other thing I do is I study various dolphin species like spinner dolphins who are uh, unique among the dolphin species in that they are what's called nocturnal feeders. They feed at night in on squid and other uh, small um, fish in deeper waters, but they come into shallow waters, including bays and along coastlines, in the morning hours to rest, socialize with their offspring, and uh, basically sleep. So they're spending a lot of, they're increasing their energy by feeding at night, and they've got to rest in the daytime. And that's an interesting, what we call a diurnal pattern of behavior. And it makes them kind of an interesting species to study. So together with the whales, I feel like this is my living laboratory. You're part of a larger team on this expedition. What are you bringing to the team um, during this expedition with National Geographic and Ocean Exploration Trust? So we've got a great team here of uh, scientists and educators from all over the world, different cultures, different perspectives, and different skills and talents in their various fields. For me, I'm both an educator and a scientist, as I explained earlier. And so what I bring is a background in behavioral ecology, um, which includes uh, studying animal communities, specifically dolphin and whale communities, down to the level of the individual. So one of the things I'm interested in are the life histories of individual whales and dolphins and tracing those over years and over decades, because we can learn a lot 
by understanding that communities are actually comprised of individuals who have um, different reproductive parameters, different motivations, and different social associations. And that's one of the things that really interests me. So I have a broad background. I can do acoustics and I can do migratory patterns and I can look at habitat use and behavioral ecology in general. And one of the strengths that I bring to this team is my knowledge of humpback whales and spinner dolphins and other dolphin species in Hawaii and also working with identification data so that we can trace the life histories of who we are recording uh, acoustically over time so that the vocalizations that they are making or that we are recording can be traced down to the individual. Why are dolphins and whales or cetaceans important to the ocean? Well, uh, dolphins and whales are what we call uh, near or at apex predators. And so that means that they are, in the case of humpback whales, they are feeding on a small, a swarming um, uh, shrimp-like uh, animals called krill, and which are very uh, uh, protein-rich, and also they're feeling they're feeding at a um, a little higher level where they're feeding on small schooling fish like herring and sand lance and capelin, and even uh, juvenile salmon. And so for humpback whales, they are what we call a kind of a good indicator species of the health of the ocean, if you think about it. Because if they are not doing well, they may be an indicator that the fish stocks are not doing well, and vice versa. If the fish stocks aren't doing well, we may see that show up with emaciated or very thin whales. In terms of dolphins, they are feeding on squid, so some invertebrates or cephalopods and some fish. And so they are also a good, what's called bellwether for the health of the oceans. Um, on top of it, humpback whales are also, we're thinking like a carbon sink. So what that means is that if we think about uh, uh, plants or trees that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, right? So uh, the warming of the atmosphere, we, we don't want it to get too hot. So, you know, people plant a lot of trees in the hope that the trees will take out some of the carbon dioxide, but actually phytoplankton, these plant-like creatures, which can be miles, vast miles, they could take out a lot more. So what promotes the production of phytoplankton? Well, whale poop. So the whales are pooping, it provides a lot of nutrients for the phytoplankton, but whales are also diving. So when they dive, they're mixing up that soup, which is creating more nutrient-rich waters for the phytoplankton. And finally, whales can live to about, humpback whales can live to about 90 or 100 years old. And when finally it comes to the end of their life and they die, those carcasses, think about it, a 45 foot long, 85,000 pound animal now sinking, that provides all this nutrient-rich food for the phytoplankton as well. So if you think about conserving humpback whales and growing their numbers so that they've returned back to pre-whaling conditions, that's going to help the planet in a very natural way by allowing more phytoplankton that'll help take out the carbon dioxide. So in some ways, humpback whales are a good indicator species as well as the dolphins for the health of the oceans, but also they can be used to promote the health of the oceans as well through the production of phytoplankton. What is the research question that you are trying to answer on this expedition? So this is a very, very special expedition for learning about dolphin and whale communication. And so We've known for a long time that dolphins of many species produce whistles. Those are pretty much social sounds, clicks, many of which are used for echolocation, basically uh, click-like sounds that go through the water, bounce off of objects, and the dolphin can appreciate the spatial structure of the object. And if you take the click sounds and you kind of compress them in time, they sound like squawks, like <laughs> which are really like social sounds. So that's dolphins and humpback whales, of course. Males produce this long, complex 
vocal communication called song. It's part of the mating system. And there are also non-song sounds that the whales produce. And we really don't know a lot about them. We kind of record some of the context. What's been missing from both of those studies is in groups of either dolphins or whales, being able to localize, which means identify the specific individual that is vocalizing. So when I'm talking right now, you see my mouth opening up. If we were to study gorillas and one was producing a sound, you'd see the sender of the information opening its mouth and everybody else might be listening. So you can tell who the sender of the information is. With dolphins and whales, they don't have to open their mouths. They don't have to do anything that you could view to be able to produce a sound. So if you just go in the water and you watch a school of dolphins or you record with a single microphone called a hydrophone underwater, you would just hear a lot of sounds. You would not know which animal is the sender and which animal is the receiver. And so now with this new technology on this very special expedition involving multiple hydrophones, multiple microphones working together in concert, we're actually able to, for the first time, pinpoint in conjunction with video, which dolphins or whales are producing the sound and which are the listeners. And so with the critical part of this is not just the array of the hydrophones, but also combining that with the video so we can see what they're doing at that time, what their behavior is, and start learning a little bit more detail about what they are communicating about and who's communicating. That's the key. How do dolphins specifically use the underwater soundscape based on your knowledge? So dolphins use the underwater soundscape in a variety of ways. Okay. So dolphins produce sound. They produce social uh, whistles or squawks. <laughs> That's what a squawk sounds like in social contexts. And they also can produce echolocation sounds. So that are click like sounds. They produce all of these in their nasal passages, which, you know, the blow holes on top of the head. So inside you see two sacks and there are some things, funny names, monkey lips and rabbit ears and the air gets pushed back and forth. Like if you had a balloon and you blew it up and you let the air out. That's what it would be like, this flapping of these lips, which cause this sound. Anyway, the echolocation sounds are click sounds that are projected out through the forehead, which has some fat in it of the dolphin. They're focused in a beam and they bounce off of things in the water environment, which basically give the dolphin an image of what's out there. So dolphins can actively use the soundscape. They can listen to other dolphins. So that's part of the soundscape. Uh, are they interrogating an object? So can they eavesdrop on that? Or is there like some social stuff going on over there and I'm watching it and listening at the same time? So that's one of the things. The other is that they can listen to the soundscape for things like fish schools nearby, right? Or perhaps some type of predator like maybe killer whales. And so there's a passive and then there's an active use of the soundscape. And so it's really important that that soundscape is as quiet and pristine as possible so that communication is facilitated. However, if there's too much noise in the ocean, it would be like you walking with your friend into a noisy room and you couldn't talk to each other because it was too loud. So we know that certain vocalizations can stand out to a researcher. What are signature whistles? So for decades, we've known that uh, dolphins uh, like bottlenose dolphins, produce what's called signature whistles. These are individual whistles like <whistles> that are associated with individual dolphins. Uh, and for a long time, we were just learning about how these are used. So an individual dolphin, most of what it's producing in terms of its whistles is its signature whistle. But we also learned in the 1980s that when dolphins are separated from each other, a dolphin might produce the signature whistle of its close companion if it can't see it any longer. Fast forward through the 1990s and 2000s, we now have learned that these whistles, dolphins can actually remember the whistle of a close associate over decades. That's what's called social memory, and it's incredible. 
that dolphin long-term social memory rivals our own or elephants, which is really neat. And we've also learned in some very recent research that in fact, dolphin signature whistles are what's called referential. They can refer to themselves or another dolphin. So they are in very unique and they are learned. They're learned whistles, just like we learn our names. They're the names of the dolphins that are socially learned through vocal learning. So when we go out to study the natural world, we're obviously trying to understand and discover new things, right? The explorer mindset sparks curiosity, but we also need to collect that information in a streamlined way. So when we're out on the boat working together and you are studying the behavior of dolphins, what tools do you use? So uh, the first tool of anybody who's an animal behaviorist, whether you're studying something on land or whether you're studying something like dolphins or whales at sea, is you've got to have a uh, listing of the types of behaviors that the animal does. And we call this an ethogram. And an ethogram basically is a list of, it could be a list of behavioral states like resting or traveling or act, being active or sleeping, but it can also be a list of more micro behaviors, right? Like uh, slapping one's tail or Eat, feeding on a particular food or anything like that. So a list of behaviors and a list of behavioral states. And so I have that on my trusty iPad that I um, go out into the field with. And so when we find, let's say, a pod of spinner dolphins, the very first thing that we do is we want to find out before we go in to take some photographs or put our uh, underwater acoustic localization devices in, the very first thing is we stand back for a second res at a respectful distance and we want to know how many dolphins are we seeing. In, is it a group or is it a single one? And how are they organized? Are we seeing mothers and calves together and then we see some adult looking whale uh, dolphins together? And how spread apart are they? So the very first thing we do is we all look and one person says, the minimum number, the maximum number, and the best estimate of the number. And how far they are spread apart from each other. Are they close together, real tight group, or are they spread out or clustered? That's the very first thing we do. The next thing that we do is I take a little microphone, I put it in the water. I want to know, are they vocalizing? Are we hearing some communication? And in fact, yesterday, we did hear that. We did hear that. We counted our numbers. We had about 60 dolphins and we heard their vocalizations. And then once we did that and the behavioral state recorded on the ethogram was that they were milling. They were just going back and forth in a very quiet state. That's when we took our video arrays, hydrophone arrays with the video and we put our snorkelers quietly in the water and they just quietly went up to the dolphins and now they're recording both their vocalizations and the video of who's doing what. And that was perfect. Then they came out and then the last piece of the puzzle was want to know who the individuals are. So I took my camera with my long lens, which allows me to get really close to the dolphins. And for dolphins, the identifying feature is their dorsal fin. Right? So you got to find an identifying feature for an individual. For humans, it's often our face. We look different from each other. But for dolphins, the dorsal fin is very unique. The back of it is all etched differently, like a puzzle piece. And so you take shots of the profile of the dolphin. For humpback whales, what you do is you line up behind the whale. And when the whale dives, the underside of its tail is like our fingerprint. It's got a lot of white and black splotches, and they're unique to each whale. As an explorer, how does the power of observation play a role into the process that you use to conduct research? As an explorer, the power of observation is critical to how we conduct our research. You know, to be a really good behavioral scientist, you've got to be what's called vigilant. So you've got to be able to focus and look for key indicators. And sometimes it takes time for this to unfold, right? So you've got to be able to observe for quite a long time. 
and know what you're looking for. That's why that ethogram comes in. And also be able to recognize not only familiar behaviors, but also behaviors that you might not expect. So we've got a little place in there for comments in our ethogram where we can write down the very the time that unusual events occur that we might not have expected. So the ethogram is very powerful, but there's nothing like the power of observation. And so I'm wearing regular glasses right now, but when I'm outside and it's really sunny, I need to put on my sunglasses so I can be even a better observer. And so when we're on the boat, it makes no sense when we're trying to observe for everybody to look in the same direction. So what we do is we break the boat up into a clock where the front of it is 12 o'clock, the back is six, the right side, what we call starboard side is three o'clock, and the left side, what we call port is nine o'clock. Everybody takes a different piece of the puzzle of the boat to look at. And everybody's a really good observer just looking in that, in that sector. And when they see a hint of a dolphin or a whale, they don't take their eyes off it. They keep observing, being a good explorer observer and saying, two o'clock, blow from a, dolph from a whale or dorsal fin from a dolphin. And the boat driver who's driving the boat will say, well, at what distance? And they'll estimate the distance and then the boat will turn in that direction. They keep their eye on what they saw because only they saw it. And then we can drive and we can investigate it. So the power of observation is critical on any explorer's um, assignment. How can what we discover on this expedition be used to protect the ocean that we all depend on? Part of what we are doing is not just being explorers out with dolphins and whales, but also trying to learn as much as we can so that we can protect them from various threats that they encounter. And for dolphins and whales, entanglement is a threat and vessel collisions is a threat, but one of the largest threats is from ocean noise. So man-made noise that has been increasing over time. In order to understand that threat, very first thing we've got to do is we've got to describe and map out the natural vocalizations that whales and dolphins make. Because if you don't understand what they're producing in the first place, it's really hard to understand what boat noise, what that effect might have, or ship noise, or exploring the ocean bottom with seismic surveys, what any of that does. So the very first thing we knew we'd need to do, and we're doing on this expedition, is mapping out their natural communication. Once we understand that, then we can be better at protecting that natural communication and creating a quieter world for the dolphins and whales against things that interrupt it. Tell us a little bit about when you first connected with the ocean and when you decided that you wanted to make this your livelihood. Well, I first connected with the with the aquatic environment when I was about three years old. I was very fortunate. I had a dad who loved the ocean and lakes. And so he would take me at a very young age and take me after work into the water with him in his arms. And very quickly, at about three years old, he taught me how to swim. And so once I could do that, I felt like I was powerful, like I could actually put on a little mask and I could look at all everything going on. And I was fascinated, whether it was a lake or the ocean, I was fascinated by all the sea creatures, the invertebrates and the fish and uh, everything I could find. And so my family would regularly take, I was born in New York, but we'd regularly take vacations to ocean sites. And I would just go on my own down to the ocean and learn from people who culturally knew the ocean. I was very fortunate they would kind of take me under their wing and teach me how to clam in um, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, or when I came to Hawaii much later in my life, they, I would talk to people who knew the ocean, who had that natural, um, you know, passed down from generation to generation and learn from them about what was important for them in the ocean. And so through all of that, I was able to take my scientific viewpoint and overlay it with a cultural perspective. And that was the best way for me to be able to learn about the ocean in a respectful way and also give back to my community too. So inspired from my family very early on and then 
seeking out opportunities to interact with my community and also to learn as much as I could about the ocean. What is a piece of advice you wish you could tell your younger self when it comes to pursuing marine science? Well, I think that advice I would have given to myself when, about pursuing marine science when I was young was to um, break out of my shell and to even explore more. So I was pretty good. I mean, I enjoyed the marine environment from a very early age on, and I actually sought out a couple of opportunities to join expeditions when I was a kid, actually, with other kids. And that was great because it was a social environment and we all loved the ocean and that was really terrific. And so I would have given myself advice to do a lot more of that. Seek out opportunities, what we call now applied learning experiences, but really these are like internships. So whether you, uh, my first were in high school actually, um, I got a little scholarship to go and study invertebrates around Oahu to, and to get skills like I did diving the moment I could when I was young. And I became a lifeguard when I was a kid. And just more and more experience immersing myself in the marine environment and wherever I could, I had a mask and fins with me and my snorkel and I would just get in and learn as much as I could. So instinctively, and then also when I got to college, I took a lot of classes where I could learn from others about the marine environment. So I was always in a learning experience and also surrounding myself with people who were knowledgeable about the marine environment. That was really important too. So I would tell myself to do a lot more of that and to enjoy life. What does being an explorer mean to you? So being an explorer to me can be summarized in a couple of words. Curiosity. So always be curious about the world. Um, be a good observer. So instead of rushing into something, sit back sometimes and just watch, whether it's a conversation with people in your family or your friends, be an observer, be an observer of the world. Um, taking time out to observe. So when I go scuba diving with friends, there are people who love to just rush through the water and everything passes them really quickly. But what I like to do is I like to sit in front of a reef quietly and just watch as things unfold. And you'd be really surprised because sometimes there are like mooring eels hiding in holes or fish that are just peeking out. And if you're really quiet and you're kind of like telling yourself like, I'm a piece of driftwood, don't pay attention to me start coming out and showing you, revealing what their lives are all about. And actually, that's the way we are our best observers with dolphins and whales, not putting ourselves into the situation, but rather just sitting on the periphery and watching as things unfold. And once the dolphins or whales become very comfortable with us, they start doing their natural behaviors and letting you be an observer and a recorder. So I would say be curious, be observant, and also be flexible. That's really, really important. So whatever life hands you, think about the po how can you can turn that into a positive and be flexible with it. And that's one of the things that we need to do on our teams always. Sometimes the weather changes. And we've got to be flexible and adaptive with that. So everybody from all walks of life, take that into account. And we work together, right? On this team right here, we've got a shark team and we've got a dolphin and whale team. And those teams have different goals, but they've got to communicate with each other and work together. And that's the last piece of advice I would say is don't be afraid to communicate and work together with others. And through that, you'll benefit, you'll be a great explorer, and you'll make discoveries in the world around you.